Okay. So as I was saying, we're on the precipice of migrating away from front end and moving towards back end. This is right along the time I want to do that, right at the midterm um, during the uh, the mid semester, where we spend half the semester delving into the front end technologies, and then we'll spend the second half of the semester delving into the back end uh, technologies. And actually, in my opinion, it'll probably be quicker for us to start doing back end because we're going to be using the same language that we've now been learning to use for the front end development. So I want to say for the last month and a week, we talked about JavaScript uh, back end, like uh, the, um, the basic syntax of JavaScript, how to declare a function and selection statements and repetition statements and, and how to define scope and how to create uh, variables. Then we went into the data structures uh and all of the implemented methods for our data structures like our arrays and our maps and our and our sets and and our objects and then we went to object oriented programming we looked at inheritance and then we looked at the document object model then we looked at the event driven system so at this level we should know pretty much the syntax of javascript really well and that's not going to change as we migrate to the back end our syntax is going to be relatively consistent. The only differences we're going to have uh, between our front end and our back end is what uh, what our APIs are going to be. So obviously, for front end development, we're developing to run our application with inside the browser environment. So we get access to HTML elements. We get access to CSS stylings. We get access to uh, the, the runtime environment defined inside of the browser, which gives us a globally scoped window object that gives us all of the really cool functionality that gives us access to the DOM. It gives us access to uh, the window API, which has like the uh, a couple of interesting things that's that's going to be uh, particular to the browser itself. So when we move over to Node. All Node is is going to be a runtime environment that runs JavaScript from the operating system. We are no longer reliant on having to open up the browser application to execute our JavaScript code. We can, we can actually uh, go right from the console, right from the terminal, and launch our JavaScript applications from there. So very much like we might build a Python uh, application, we could start building JavaScript applications. And one of the reasons why this will be really good is we can be consistent and cohesive with the language we've been learning, so we can really build up a full mastery of it on how to use it, not just on the front end of a, of a web application, but on the back end of a web application. So we don't have to relearn how to use uh, a programming language, but we can also rely on a massive amounts of tools and libraries that have been de designed for the Node runtime environment for Node uh, to be able to build out web servers. And so the last bit that we're going to discuss uh, for front end for now at least, for front end, before migrating to the back end, is going to be what this most recent lab is, is for. So I launched the lab this past weekend, and it's due on Friday, um, where, uh, where the intent is to show you how you, from our browser, we can start issuing uh, messages outside of the browser to other web servers. So we can actually use our web client to start sending requests. And so the mechanism by which we do that is HTTP. That's the hypertext transfer protocol, which is going to be essentially the message delivery service that allows web clients to cross communicate to web servers and then have web servers respond back to the web clients with whatever they might be requesting. So I'm going to spend much more time next lecture really delving into HTTP from a client perspective. And that will lead us then into installing Node and starting to talk about how to build web servers and how to send responses to web clients. And then we'll take a look at HTTP from a server perspective after that and actually start doing some things on the, uh, the back end. 
So I'm looking forward to that. We'll start doing that probably next week, and we'll finish out uh, this week, this Thursday, doing um, – doing uh learning how to do http calls how to do essentially uh restful calls from the client side to external servers which will lead up to the next homework which will be to produce a browser app that uses a rest api so i'll talk more about that after uh, uh sometime next week when we get there so with that said uh i really want to spend this time since i know a lot of people's crunched with uh midterms and studying I don't want to offer up too, too, too much new content. I'm going to wait until after midterm grades are in to lecture on new content, uh, simply because I think everyone will be more receptive. So I want to spend today's lecture really going into the final project and ensuring that everyone kind of has an understanding of what the expectations are for the final project. Not only that, but uh, have an expectation of these, these homework assignments that I give, how you might best utilize those uh, by scoping them towards tangible things that might relate to your, your end project. So every time I, I, I give an assignment, usually it relates to expanding the boundaries of what you've learned in a way that will eventually get you very comfortable building full stack applications. And as we mentioned before, a full stack application is one where you have a front end layer. And so for us, our front end layer is the browser. You have a back-end la layer. Uh, your back-end layer, for our purposes in web applications, is going to be a web server. And then you have a third layer, which is going to be like your data store. It's going to be where all of the data that's critical for your application to run that isn't computed or processed, something that, that you have to maintain, something where you have some kind of data persistence, uh, is maintained. So it's, it's pretty. Um, uh, important when building a, a multifaceted application, an application that's essentially distributed by nature, which is what a full stack application is. A uh, part of your application runs in the browser, a part of your application runs on a web server, uh, which is almost never the same machine as where your client is running. And uh, you want to have one source of truth where all your data is stored, and that's what your database is going to be. So, um, and so the final project, and so I guess let me hop into my uh, Moodle here. So uh, let me hop on over here. Okay, so let's go into Moodle because I made all these available. So I want to spend today making sure that everyone knows what the final project expectations are so you can start planning out a solid proposal for this. Uh, okay, so let's go to here. And so if you go to the very bottom, so I'm in Moodle, you should be able to see maybe not all of this because some of this is hidden from students, uh, but most of this I tried to make available. So if you go to the very bottom of like the homework labs and project section, you'll see that I have right here the uh, the project documents. So there's going to be five project documents that you'll have to turn in over the course of this final project. And so these are already available to you. So I would implore everyone to, first of all, uh, complete proposal one. So if you're not aware, uh, I think I sent an email out already. I definitely mentioned it on Discord. Uh, the first part of the final project is already assigned. And I believe I set that due date to be April 2nd. And if I'm not mistaken, the last day of class, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is May 11th? Is that is that right, about May 11th or May 12th? That sounds about right. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so so we want to try to target. So, and I think, I don't think, uh, and then I think we go into uh, final exams. So we started a little late this semester. Like this class didn't start, have its first lecture until February 2nd. So that's about two weeks later than we typically start. But I think on the flip side, we have an additional week in May. So if I'm not mistaken, last 
day of classes is May 11th, but then we have our finals week, which goes all the way until like May 18th. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. And so, um, and so that means that in order to make, ensure everyone has ample amount of time to be able to start creating their full stack application, we need to start the path to planning. So the very first part, and so uh, I, I want to kind of walk through this uh, today, but effectively your project can be split into nine gradable portions. The first of which is just going to be your project proposal, all of which is detailed right here. So really, at this stage, I want you to be able to determine a couple of things. The first thing is going to be whether you're going to work in isolation or whether you're going to work as a team. So if you do want to work as a team, you should try to seek out uh, other students who also want to work in a team. And so I've made on Discord a channel available just for that, to be able to seek out and, uh, and try to find team members. Now, so this is the way I'm going to manage teams. I'm going to suggest that, based off of my prior experience, both working in a team and uh, uh, managing student teams, the optimal group size I find to be typically about two to three members. Any more than that, and the there's an administrative penalty of just being able to try to manage and coordinate with uh, that like four or five or six people becomes cumbersome and then trying to figure out the division of labor that's equitable um, across the team members can, can become kind of difficult as well. So in, in my own experience, smaller teams are more agile and more responsive to be able to make quick decisions and implement things. However, I'm not restricting team sizes. So if you want to be in a five person team, then I'm not going to stand in your way. However, understand for each member of a team, I'm going to have higher expectations as to the project scope and the feature set. So like I want a three person team to be three times the work as a single person team. So I would want a five person team to be five times the work as a single person team. So keep that in mind when, uh, when forming yourself into cohesive units that I, I will have greater expectations for teams. And rightfully so, because you're able to uh, distribute the labor and do more at once. Um, okay. Let me hop back, not there, but over here. Okay, so let's talk about the first part of the final, because a majority of your grade uh, comes from the final project. This is what we're, we're all building towards. So. Here we want to propose an idea, and so the idea you want to propose is going to be one that is conducive to being a full stack application. So I want to make sure before the project proposals are due that everyone understands what it means to be a full stack uh, uh, application, because we've really focused thus far on the front end, and we're just now starting to get into a point where we're going to move into the back end. Uh, so, a full stack application is going to have a part of the application logic that runs inside the browser. It will have a part of the application that runs on a web server. The communication between your web client and the web server will go through HTTP requests and responses. This is a, uh, a pattern that's called... Uh, a REST, building a REST API, representational transfer, um, uh, hmm. I'm sorry, representational state transfer. That's what REST stands for. And I will talk more about that when we get to those slides, when we start working on backend, um, when we start working on our own backend services. So all that means is that your front end can't hold all the data or the logic. You're gonna the the front end is going to rely on a back end service to do some of that work. An example of that is this lab six. In this lab, lab six, the front end is a contact form. The front end communicates with the back end service. In this instance, we're using Google Forms as our back end service to deliver that data. That data then gets maintained by the back end service. 
at which we can, if we wanted to, we can query it back to the front end and do things with it. Um, we're going to only use uh, Google Forms as uh, to manage your contact forms. It's not good as a backend service for anything else, in my opinion. So we're going to start looking at other services that we can use uh, until we learn how to build our own uh, while playing around with, uh, with uh, HTTP for the browser side of things from the client perspective. And so typically the way this would work is the most common use case uh, that you encounter with a backend service and the way that uh, a full stack application or backend application is going to really deviate from what we've already been doing is that a backend application has logic that it can do. It has a statefulness that it can maintain uh, that our current models do not. So if you think about how we've been developing our web app, our, our browser applications thus far, we can go ahead and deploy those onto GitHub pages. Now GitHub pages offers us a web server, but it's what's called a static web server. And what we mean by static web server is that we can request our HTML documents from the server, and it will go ahead and provide all the associated resources along with that HTML document, such as images or video or audio or CSS documents or JS documents or additional HTML documents that might be anchor tagged or hyperlinked to the original HTML document. But outside of delivering those, it, it doesn't service any other requests. So the only type of request it services is a Git request. And in particular, the only kind of Git request it services is a Git for the document, the HTML documents. So a, a application that's a little bit more dynamic, that has a web service that is not considered static, is one that can have logic on the back end. It can, it can do computations. Uh, so here's here would be a use case. Uh, a simple login system requires a backend service. So if you create a web application that requires a user to log in into an account system, well, the account system is not managed at the front end, at the browser end. The account sys the account management and login system and password and username is managed on a backend service. And from the front end, when you fill out a form, registering a username and a password that gets passed to the back, the web server, which would then check, first of all, to make sure that the username might be unique to ensure there's no one else who has that account name. And then second of all, it'll then apply the password to that account name and then allow you and, and then return back to you uh, custom specialized uh, HTML content that might represent information just for you. So think about when you log in to say, for instance, your Amazon account, if you have an Amazon account, you would log in and then your account information, such as your payment information that's only available to you would then be displayed to you. And so that's all managed by logic that's driven on the back end by the web server and not something that's implemented on the front end on the uh, within the web browser. Now, the logic would look really pretty this similar to what we were already doing. It would be in JavaScript, so the syntax and the mechanisms would be similar. It's just happening in it at a different layer of our application. So uh, the big crux of this is when you're thinking of an idea to propose, think of something that distributes well across both a web client and a web server. And so this will be something that you'll get, you'll, you're going to get more comfortable with, with web uh, um, servers as we start implementing the labs and as we start doing the lectures on Node and Express and Mongo and the other backend services will use likely Passport or um, user authentication and whatnot. And so we'll, we'll start to explore the various back end uh, modules that will help us build applications for the remaining portions of the semester. But it shouldn't, but because we haven't touched that yet, shouldn't preclude you from being able to think of ideas that would require a back end service.
because surely I think everyone's had enough experiences with web applications to think of concepts that necessitates both a front end and a back end. And then, then once we start talking about a back end, all the databases therefore is for uh, data persistence. So whatever your application is, think about what data needs to be maintained across each time you go to access the application. Again, going back to something super simple, like a user login system, the data that has to be managed is the collection of users and their associated data, like their name or their password or things like that. So keep those considerations in mind when you propose an idea. Uh, one thing I would consider is please use the uh, most recent Hilo game, or I guess not most recent, but uh, Lab 5 as an example of how you might want to start to build out your project. And this is true for all the other homeworks as well, such as the browser application. I would recommend that you start with identifying what are the core principle features you have to deliver for your application to be considered a success. And that's what we'll label as your minimal viable product or MVP. So when you propose your idea, think about what the most lean version of what you can deliver would be and still consider a success. But don't leave it as an MVP. Consider what a full featured or feature rich variant of your application would be. And so this will allow you to kind of iteratively build out your app without having to stress out uh, about trying to hit your milestone to get where you need to be at the very end of the semester. Anyway, so for this first proposal, I just want to make sure that everyone declares to their teams, they propose an idea that involves building a full stack application. A full stack application just means something that is browser side, it's uh, web server side, and it's something that has persistent data. And then once you have that idea, you're just going to write a very short abstract. It only has to be one or two paragraphs long. It's just kind of ex going to explain what your application is. And then you make a blog post. So now, now the realization about what the blog posts are for will come into fruition. The blog posts are going to be used realistically as your dev diaries to, to keep me up to date on your projects. But this should be something that you, you manage anyway. Um, so on your portfolio page, if you have a blog, uh, if, uh, if you have an area where you've declared a collection of blog posts, this is where you would publish those. Alternatively, uh, there are, I, I, I know I've had also stated that in, uh, an alternative to blog articles that give a dev diary, you can also create a very comprehensive uh, markdown of a readme in a Git repository that hosts whatever your source code documents are. And that's also usually typically acceptable. Uh, for, for turn ins. So the idea is, though, is that you create a, something that provides context in what you are designing and developing that you're communicating with the general public. So in the real world, you not only create software, but you have to create documentation and support of your software that gives context to other team members, to other to potential clients, or just the public at large as to what it is your application does, how it works, how you install it. Uh, and a lot of times when you start designing a new app, you want to declare what you're, uh, uh, what you're designing. That's what this blog article is really designed to do. It's to be an announcement of what you're going to build. Okay, with that said, is there anything in terms of questions related to this part one that's already been declared? Does that everyone kind of feel comfortable and confident with what is happening at this stage of the final project? Excellent, yeah. I'm excited to see what everyone's gonna make. Okay, so the next thing so I kind of want to actually go through so everyone can actually see these documents so that you don't get too much overlapping. Um, so the next thing that's going to happen, okay, click here, is going to be the specifications document. 
So I would almost recommend that everyone goes through and read all five of these documents. Uh, well, we're going to get through them today. So I guess we're going to read them right now. Uh, but this way you get a strong understanding of where this project's going and how to best to prepare. And now that I've started the domino effect of um, providing the first, uh, the first push of the proposal, you could probably suspect that each document thereafter is going to be due one week after the last. So if the proposal is due uh, April 2nd, then the... Um, then part two will be due like April 9th, like a week after your proposal. And then part three will be due the week after that. Uh, and then part four will be due a week after that. And the fifth and final part of your documentation will be due a week after that. And the reason why is we only have, uh, what, like a month and a week? We only, if, if today, uh, we have probably have about uh, one and a half months, right? We still have a week left roughly in March or maybe more than a, a week. We probably have what, like a week and a half of March and we get a week and a half of uh, May and we get all of April. So we probably have just about two months. So if I have five documents and if I stage them starting in April, then four of those documents will carry us all the way to the end of April, which means the last document will hit the very first week of May, which means this is about when we have to start doing demos. So, so I just wanna, I just wanna convey, even though it hasn't been technically assigned yet in Moodle, you can expect a deadline for each of these documents to be spread a week apart. And that would leave us all the way uh, at the beginning of May then, where you'd actually start having your deliverables emerge. Of course, yeah. So multiple groups can have the same, the same talk. No, like, um, sure, you can have competition. Like, uh, you might have two different groups who want to make a social media app. And so that's perfectly fine. You can have different considerations, different use cases. Uh, you might end up with an app that looks like Discord versus an app that looks like... Uh, uh, like an Instagram or whatnot. Like just because you have multiple groups that have a similar concept me doesn't mean that the final product is going to be similar at all. They can have very different similar use cases. Although I do want to see um, projects that are as feature rich and as interesting as possible. And that's true for the browser app as well. I know I had talked to some students about this and they asked, say for instance, if it was okay to do like a to-do list or if it'd be okay to do like a uh, uh, like a calculator or something like that. I'm like uh, as the as j just like with Lab Five, it's okay to start with that as your MVP, as your minimal viable product. Get something that's up and running, but then add features to it. Try to consider use cases that make your application something that you would actually want to use and show off. So in the instance of a calculator. Uh, let's say it's uh, a calculator for a specific type of things that's worth tracking over time, for instance. Like, let's say it's a calorie uh, calculator. Then it makes sense, if I were to really want to use this as an application, I wouldn't just want to compute my caloric intake for one individual meal and forget about it. I'd want to save that in local storage. And then every time I record that, I might also want to put a timestamp on that because I could just invoke the date object right from the window object or the date class from the window object and record that. Then once I do that, perhaps then I want to look at uh, visually displaying that in an interesting way. So if I record more than one sets of calories, maybe what I want to do is plot my caloric intake, uh, my intake over the course of the day. Maybe I want to show interesting data relevant to that. Uh, so, so these are the things I'm talking about. So what might have started out as a very simple, let's compute how many calories I took in, you can quickly then keep asking your question, yourself questions, well, how can I make this better? And when you get to a point where you feel like it's good enough to be an application you would actually use, then you've hit an app that's worth making. Does, does that make sense? 
So, yeah, I, I, I definitely would prefer to see people strive to make things that are interesting enough that they themselves would want to use and not something that's just simply academic, right? Like a reason why we kind of dropped uh, the uh, projects that were like convert Fahrenheit to Celsius or Celsius to Fahrenheit is intrinsically, they're not very interesting. They're just purely academic use cases of what to do in the confines of a programming language. So here, I, I, I want to be, I want to be more creative. I'm always, I always endeavor to being creative with uh, the project. So I, I hope everyone else kind of follows this with that. Okay. Anyway, so after you get your proposal and your teams and your initial dev diary announcing what you're going to build. The second document is going to be what's called a specifications document. And you can anticipate that this document is going to be due April 9th. And so the objective here is to identify all what we'll call the user stories. So here you're going to detail all the apps features and determine if the features is a front end concern, if it's a back end concern or a database responsibility. So let's contrast this towards what you're turning in right now. So here you're going to propose an idea for a full stack application where the application must include a front end, a back end, and a database operation. Uh, and so here you're just writing an abstract where we define an abstract as uh, it provides just short background information about what problem your app solves. So again, imagine you're building a health application. Then the problem is people want to maintain a healthier lifestyle. Having a web application allows them to track their, uh, their caloric output and their caloric in input from any device and have access wherever they're at. So building a web application, they can access it from their phone or from their computer. And then it allows them to manage something that might be something they have to track uh, over an extended period of time. So again, this is, this is identifying a problem and your app is a solution to that problem. And that's almost always the use case of software, right? Software is always designed to solve a problem. Even if that problem is to automate uh, a mundane task, right? So that's what you're identifying first. So your proposal should be to solve a problem and that's what you're, you're defining. And then you will define the basic features. So in the example I just gave, a health app, some of the basic features would be be able to input your calorie intake, maybe input your weight, maybe input your BMI, maybe input the amount of exercises you do or how much you exercise, uh, whether that is like distance walked or whether it's reps or whatever, to be able to track that kind of uh, information. Maybe it might be able to create like a... Uh, caloric intake as well. So I, maybe I can track my calories or maybe record when I eat throughout the day, right? So these might just all be the basic big picture things that a app that's dedicated to um, health awareness might cover. And notice something like that shouldn't be more than one or two paragraphs. Here, you're giving me the elevator pitch about what you're going to make specifications, you're going to now stretch that out. You're going to identify what are the user cases of the app. So let's go back to that health app I was talking about. This might be uh, talking about the user who uses it to track their calories and how they might interface with your application to actually achieve that. Uh, it would be to define if I'm using it to track the amount of exercise and I do, what are, what are the steps that go through with that? So here, that's what we mean by user stories is what are the sets of interactions and the responses the user gets back from your application using it in the capacity for the objective that your app is supposed to solve. And so here, at this point, we're going to stretch out. We're going to start with that kind of uh, what I'll call the like topmost statement of your application, your elevator pitch, the ambiguous concept that you might have had and we're starting to define in a much more precise way how that's actually going to materialize as a set of features so and, and hence the, the the term here specifications what we're doing here is we're going to start building our specifications 
uh, report, our specifications requirements. What are all the features we would like our app to have in totality? And from these features, we will be able to identify what we will call a minimal viable product. What is the least amount of features we will have from our specifications report that we can consider deliverable? And then we will prioritize what features we will want continue to add until we run out of time and we, we, we deliver something that we believe is either complete or as feature rich as possible based off of the constraints of time that we have. And then each time we design a feature, we should try to consider, well, is this going to be a feature that is something that's going to be managed at the front end? Is it something that will have to be managed as a back end service? Or is it going to be something that will be managed, you know, or modeled somehow in uh, the database? And so features, honestly, usually break down into actually being a, a combination of those. So try to think about how the feature would be defined as a front end asset versus the back end asset versus something that resides in your database. And typically, just so you know, when we refer to a back end uh, uh, resource, we're talking about something that your front end will interface through, uh, through uh, a RESTful call. So you can think of a RESTful call as essentially just a function that's defined on your web server that can be invoked by the front end, did I say front end? So it's a function that's defined in the back end. So in your web server, that can actually be invoked by the front end via, via an HTTP request. So one of the cool things that we're about to learn and that we're currently learning in the lab right now is that our front end can send requests to back to, to web servers. And web servers, the, the, those requests can be more than just getting new HTML documents, it can actually be to invoke the web server to process and compute some information or even to change state on the server side of things. And so the way that a web client can tell the web server to, to invoke functions is the same way that our web controller that we saw in our MVC pattern, the same way a controller can tell our a model to change state right? You send a message to, to it and, and, and say, invoke this function. So we will send a message via an HTTP request that is listening for a web client to tell to do something. And it responds to that request by doing whatever the function is and then returning back a response to let us know what the new state is or to give us some information back. And really, that's the purpose is of what HTTP allows. It allows us to cross communicate between web servers and uh, web clients. Okay, so once we include this kind of user flow of your app, uh, where you might identify the different modes you might need, and so a user story might be what is the regular user, what is the administrative user, who is a guest user. So start consider of thinking of your user stories in terms of the use cases of who will log into your app and what roles will they be and how is the app going to be different based off of each role that's using the app. Then determine what those front end features are going to be for each of those roles, what the back end features are going to be for each of those roles, and what those database features. And in this instance, you want to be descriptive as possible. And then for each of these, I would recommend doing a uh, either a dev diary or some kind of blog article. But after the initial blog post, I believe I make these uh, bonus components of these documents. So, okay. So, is there any questions in terms of part two, the specifications document? So, notice what we're doing here is we start with something nebulous, and we're starting to design out in much greater granularity what it is your application is going to be done. And so the idea behind these five design documents is to design to such a degree that when it comes time to actually implement, it will be easy. In fact, you could be implementing alongside doing these design documents, but you should really have a design laid out before you get any of your firm, firm implementation done. So you could like do test implementation. You could do proof of concept stuff to help foster your specifications report, to help bring into a concreteness 
concepts that might be nebulous in your own mind. But the ultimate goal is that you produce your design and documentations before you design your final architect, uh, your final architecture of your uh, of your application. Okay. So let's move on to the client. So the client design document here is going to be just the front end. And so this will be due a week after the specification report. So that would be what, like the third week of April then. And so here, really, you're going to author a design document that fully depicts your app's client side implementation. So this document would include uh, mock ups, front end mock ups, uh, and then trying to identify what your views and your controllers will be. Try to identify all the client side logic and whatever data processing responsibilities are going to happen within the browser. So pretty much everything that's going to be required for your full stack application to run on the front end component within the browser will be well defined. Here, you won't necessarily have to have your front end finished, but at least hand drawn or um, or um, visualizations of what you intend your front end to look like for each of your user stories, whether it's an admin view or guest view or a user view of your application at the various levels. So again, going back to the health application, I would probably initially launch into either to probably if in guest mode, I would probably be prompted to create an account or to be able to log in. If I'm already registered, I probably have a login screen. I would select to go into the login screen, which would then give me maybe a profile screen that gives me all the historic information that I had. So I would then depict what that looks like. I would then be given a set of, say, for instance, menu options that get, allows me to decide whether I want to do dietary input, like dietary, um, go into the dietary component of my app, or if I want to go into the uh, exercise component of my app. Or maybe I have a separate thing that's just my uh, statistics portion of my app. And so if I select, say, for instance, my dietary portion, it might give me options to be able to uh, select a time of the day and select a set of uh, calories or maybe items or, or things based off of carbohydrates or proteins or things like that. And I might have imputation. So I might have input fields and be able to submit. And then I would then identify based off of each of those views, what are my, uh, what are they going to be the components that have to display my views? Do I have nav bars? Do I have forms? Do I have images? Do I have, are the images static or are they going to be rendered based off of some kind of visualization that I'm computing upon? And if that is, what libraries am I going to depend on? Am I going to use Plotly? I'm going to use D3, which is a visualization library to be able to create any kind of uh, uh, graphics I might want. Anyway, the breakdown of how what's decided in these client uh, design documents is listed here. So the mockups, your client side logic, so things that can be processed on the browser side, which might be like interactive visualizations or showing and hiding elements or maybe sorting or searching or filtering elements. So maybe like, for instance, an idea for the sorting might be sorting the days that I ate the least amount of calories versus the most amount of calories might be an example of what you would do on the uh, client side or being able to show or hide elements or be being able to plot the actual visualization might be something that's going to be client side logic. So identifying what processing is going to happen to client logic, what your mockups of your pages look like and what fetches you're going to have to do from the back end. What data would you have to pull, whether it's uh, your account uh, for the username and then maybe any kind of the dietary uh, 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 collections that they have or any of the exercise collections they have, like understanding what does not exist in the front end that has to get pulled into the front end for you to be able to do the job. And then any kinds of tools or libraries. So again, like I said, if you're doing visualizations like Plotly or D3, or whether you're going to uh, depend on a, a continuous two-way communication between the web server and the client, then maybe you want to use WebSockets. Or if you want to do like a video game, perhaps you're going to use something like Phaser. 
or if you're going to have responsive web design, maybe it's bootstrap. So I try to give as much uh, suggestions on what I'm looking for in the documentation uh, here. So does this much make sense on how each of these documents is really designed over the course of these couple of weeks to be able to get you to articulate in greater and greater detail what your full stack application is going to manifest itself at. So the proposal that's due on the second is going to be essentially a general notional thing, which then is going to get hammered into specifications, which is then get a to become a fully defined requirements report on your client on on just your client's design portion. And realistically, this is what you're going to implement from. This is going to give you all your information on what you need to be able to look at your mockup and say, how can I make that look like that in HTML and CSS? And then you'll look at your client logic and say, okay, how can I implement this in JavaScript? And you'll look at your server fetches and you're like, okay, how can I make a uh, request using HTTP to get this information from the backend service once we have that implemented? Because you're going to be implementing just not just this web client, but your web server. And then you could uh, start looking at tools that do some of these jobs for you. Like you don't necessarily have to define how to build visualizations like uh, like uh, um, uh, math, like the visualizations inside JavaScript. They have plenty of tools that do that. So start looking for the tools that do that or the libraries and modules that can do that for you. And, and, so, and start learning how to play around with them so that you can utilize that in your own application. Okay, so leading to that, you can probably see where these other, where these other documents are gonna be going. So after the client side, and you can actually work, and I would actually um, suggest that you work in all these in tandem with one another. So even if they're not due at the same time, if you're designing a front end here and you kind of know what your server fetches are, then maybe you should start making some back end, some notes here on what your server fetches are going to be here because it's going to go into the same kind of report. Because again, these are your specification documents for being able to cater to your front end design. This is going to be your design document for just the server. So here you're going to create a design document that fully defines the app's back end services. This document should include uh, complete your complete REST API, which if you're not familiar with already, uh, we will have an entire lecture on. But to give you just a quick overview of what a REST API is, all it is is it's going to be uh, routes that we define on our on our web server. So if I go to um, let me give you an example here. So if I go here to, where does this even go? I don't know where this goes. But if I go to scalemailted github.io, this is going to go to my GitHub pages, right? So inside here, I have a repo called Gamebook Demo. And so when I go and hit submit, what's happening here is the browser is issuing an HTTP request. It's a GET request to get this index.html file. So uh, the reason why we use index.html, as you might already be aware, but I'll restate this for the sake of academia, is that uh, if I do a GET on just a root directory, then it will search, the web server will search to see if there is an index.html file in the root directory and it returns that back to me when issued a GET request. So let me hit this. Okay, yeah, this is just something that is the interactive story. So I could do this as well, right? Okay, so I like this better because this is more kind of explicit of what's happening here. So I have this URL that the web server responds to a request for, and it responds to this request by delivering an HTML document. We can set up routes just like this, URLs just like this, that when they are sent a certain request, they respond to that request by firing off or invoking a function in the web server. And that's exactly what it means to be a REST API. The REST API just means that we're using HTTP protocol for web clients to trigger events in the web server 
to invoke functions. So with that said, and again, we'll go into much more uh, de uh, definition of that when we actually get into those lectures, but that's what's going to define what our fetches are. What are going to be these endpoints? We call those endpoints. What are going to be these endpoints, these, URL, these URLs, these routes that web clients can access that can trigger some kind of activity, some kind of event in our web server to do some kind of task? We also have to identify, well, what's our server logic going to be? For each endpoint, we have to define what our server level data processing responsibilities are. And this might include like creating sessions or doing user authentication or updating whatever the model state. So if, let's say, for instance, it's a game that you're implementing. Let's say it's an, uh, a multiplayer uh, game so that uh, let's say it's a real time multiplayer game that's played right in the browser. Then each time a player goes ahead and performs some action, then you're going to mutate the model in the server. And everyone, all the clients are dependent on the server to know what the truest, what the most up-to-date version of the game data is. So that if one player uh, kills another player, then that is displayed across all the browsers at the same time, if it is a competitive game. Or maybe it could be a friendlier game. Maybe one player gives another player hugs. That would also have to be illustrated. Um, again, just like you had to identify what your tooling would be on your front end, you're going to want to identify what tooling do you intend to use on your back end. And you're going to, these are all going to be tools that we're going to get familiar with uh, over the next couple of weeks Express, Passport, Bcrypt, UUID, Socket IO. All these are examples of pre-existing tools that we might need to import or modules we have to import to be able to do what your requirements are for your application. And again, just for the client side and just for the specifications, producing a blog post with this updated set of criteria on how your app development is, is um, progressing is worth bonus points. Now, I, I did this because blog posts are unique per uh, user and not per team. So recall that each person maintains their own GitHub repositories and they maintain their own, um, their own portfolio pages. So each member can go ahead and manage their own communication about what their roles are what their impressions are, what the obstacles that they've encountered or what research they have personally done it, to facilitate the creation of this application. And so for that reason, the blog posts are an individual bonus and not a team-based bonus. So whereas teams can go ahead and deliver the same document, the bonus points are on an individual basis. Excellent. And then let, finally, let's go to the very last of these documents. And again, these are all already available. So I would recommend actually going through and doing a thorough reading of each of these uh, from the get-go so you kind of know what you'll be tasked with doing. And just reading through these will give you a better idea of how to design out your application before it comes time to build. And so it's, uh, it provides a means to build something complex or design something complex. And so for our database design document, it's very similar to our server design document or our client design document. Here, though, we will create a design document that defines the app's data models. This document should include your data schemas. Uh, should correct this and pull the L out of that. Identify all your database logic and processing responsibilities. Define whatever CRUD operations you might need for your data collection and maybe list whatever database tooling or libraries you plan to take advantage of. In this particular course, we're going to focus on using Mongo. But uh, as I mentioned previously for the other homeworks, I will not confine you to any one technology. It might, be, it might benefit you to use the technologies we cover inside the lectures and the labs. But by all means, you are free to use whatever JavaScript-related technology you might want 
for your full stack application. So if you have already taken databases and if you feel comfortable using a more traditional database or using Postgres or using some other database, you're welcome to use that. You are not forced to use Mongo as your database solution. Very similar, uh, we're going to return back to front end at the very end of the semester to look at React. So my, my, my intent here uh, is after we're done learning how to do fetch calls from our browser to send HTTP requests to web servers, we're going to immediately flip to the opposite side of that and start looking at backend services and responding to HTTP requests and building web servers. And so we're going to look at Express, and we will look at Passport, and we will look at a several other uh, node modules. We'll learn how to use NPM to install our dependencies and to be able to generate a web server for us, uh, Express to create a web server for us. Uh, so so one, once we get used to that and we get used to using Node to go ahead and deploy a web server on local hosts, we will then flip back at the very end of the semester and look at React as a front-end solution, uh, just to ensure that everyone feels comfortable using JavaScript at both a front-end and a back-end before we get too deep into the semester uh, to make it worrisome about progressing very well with this uh, final project. Because again, this is the entire point of the semester is to have this deliverable. So I want to make sure everyone's put into as as into a position to be as successful as possible with this. So yeah, so I think over the next couple of weeks, what my goals are going to be is this week we're going to finish out uh, to, uh, uh, Thursday with talking about HTTP and the Fetch API and also how to use forms from HTML to also issue HTTP requests to the back end, but how limited that is. It only allows us to do git and post, whereas we could do git, post, put, and delete from, uh, from the Fetch API. Then we'll install Node. So uh, that would be a thing that everyone should start doing between now and next week is start to look into the installation of Node on your particular system. But I'll try to provide some instructions for you uh, uh, next week when that actually becomes a little bit more relevant. Then we'll look at uh, the back end technologies uh, such as Express to, to launch out to deploy a web server. And then we'll look at starting to build REST APIs. And we'll start building REST APIs probably for throughout April. And then once we get comfortable using these back end technologies, we'll then go back to uh, towards the end of April and look at React. Uh, anyway, uh, the database design document, again, separated by schema, whatever your query logic is, whatever your CRUD operations might be, and your tooling and libraries. And again, just like the other documents, that'll be your blog post. And it's, it's my assumption that after producing these five documents, you will have planned out and designed and thought on such a deep level, such a deep uh, uh, comprehension of how your application will operate that the implementation will be relatively simple. And then you can subdivide the work based off of these design documents. So you can create work orders if you're working in a team across your team members where one person can be, design be uh, worried about this user story or this set of views or the front end uh, responsibility and someone else can be uh, assigned to a back end responsibility or managing the database or something like that. Yes, we will be using uh, the terminal to install Node. Uh, so yeah, I, and for those of you who are on Windows, I would prefer for you to invest, investigate using uh, what's called the Windows subsystem to Linux, uh, commonly referred to as WSL so that we can get true bash uh, uh, on uh, true bash compliance on our terminals for both windows and mac os or uh, or linux machines re regardless of what flavor you're going so i would like for everyone who is on windows to kind of experiment with that a little bit okay 
So these are the five documents. And again, the first one's due April 2nd. Each one thereafter is due the next Friday after that. So does this make sense? Does, does everyone feel good about how the plan is to move forward with this final uh, project? So that by the time we hit the middle of May, everyone should be in a position where they feel pretty comfortable about being able to do a full-scale demo of an application that's created across a web client, a web server, and a database. Is there any questions about this? Does, the, does this seem relatively achievable to everybody in terms of the timetables? Seems achievable to me. Excellent. Okay, so the last thing I kind of want to show, so, so again, I want to take to, to, uh, today out to really go through all five of these documents to give everyone a good understanding of how to best pr proceed, in my opinion, for this final project, given it's March 23rd, so there's still plenty of time here, so that you're not in a position where you're going to be super stressed with a ton of work to get done at, like, the beginning of May. And so, again, I, I wanted to highlight that all five of these documents of what my expectations are are already available for you. And that even if I haven't updated the date for the submissions, I will do that. I, I will do that this week. I will do that after probably on Thursday, not today, because I have grading and have audits to do today. But I will do some management in Moodle uh, uh, sometime probably late tonight to get the grades up and running. I'll go ahead and set these so that they reflect every Friday after the second will be one of these new documents. So first week of April would be this, second week of April, third week of April, fourth week of April, and probably, I don't think April has five weeks, so probably the first week of uh, May is going to be document five, which is perfect because that puts us right where we need to be to start doing our demos. And so I said that the project is broken down into nine parts, and I had only talked about five that revolve around design documents. Well, that's because the other four parts are audits. And so we will do audits of your project before it's complete. So as you turn in a front end design document, the intent is that you're working on that part of your, your application. So we can do audits of your application in isolation. We can look at just how the client end of your application is progressing along with a client side audit. We can progress how is the server side, how just the uh, RESTful calls are progressing or just the backend logic is progressing. And the database audit is just making sure that you can do your code operations into your database and make sure that you understand how to put data in and extract data out, out of your database. So we will look at your individual stacks in isolation. And then the final part would be your final demo. It'd be taking all of the specifications, taking all of your work and putting it together to be a final product. And so this allows me to have one big project. Really, the reason I have this granularity is it allows me to give you a massive project that's worth a significant portion of your grade and not make it unknown to you how you stand in that project all the way until the very end of the semester. That's one thing that I hate about project-driven classes where a large portion of your grade comes from the final project, not knowing whether you're essentially going to pass or fail until the very end. And this allows me a greater degree of granularity for that. And in a way that actually reflects what real world practices are in terms of the ramp up towards providing a deliverable. Okay, so the other thing I, I kind of want to leave off on since we discussed in great detail today, uh, almost a full hour and 10 minutes, I've been able to go into great detail on my expectations of the project and, uh, and how I think you can best kind of follow along these, uh, these documents that will help you create your application. Uh, I wanna highlight that in addition to, let me turn this on, let's see if that helps. In addition to the videos that I've been generating and the lectures I've been generating, I'm not sure if everyone's aware that Moodle has a uh, curation of content that I found to be valuable for answering a lot of questions related to full stack development. 
So I've scoured the internet to find things, uh, content that I thought was valuable, and I already have that share. So you can start working on, uh, and so really the reason why I did this is to allow you to be able to start working on parts of your application that I haven't technically covered yet inside the lectures. So if I were to go, oh, uh, don't want to be here. Okay, let me go here. So if I go, why am I only in the lab portions here? Is this not showing me everything? Oh yeah, okay, so, so if I continually scroll down through my Moodle, you'll see I have sections that are called things like uh, full stack overview, which lists all the, the, um, the skills for, for full stack development. Uh, if you go into the front end section, I have uh, added videos that talk about an introduction to like GitHub pages, a crash course in Chrome DevTools, a, a roadmap on what it means to be a front end developer where you can follow this massive essentially tree to see how one might learn all the tools from beginning to advanced on front end development. I have a section dedicated to HTML that has like the MDN documentation, set of tutorials. I have CSS that covers like Flexbox and grid layout. And so things that go into greater detail than what I can give in like an hour and 15 minutes, I provide that there. Bootstrap, although this is Bootstrap 3, we're on Bootstrap 5 now, or that might be Bootstrap 4, I don't remember, but we're on Bootstrap 5 now. Uh, JS Basic, so. Uh, I think I covered a lot of this in detail already, but at, at all, although I, JavaScript tutorial, this JavaScript.io is a great resource I find invaluable. Uh, front end, so all DOM related stuff. If you want a different perspective from the way I presented it, I, I embedded some videos from there. Uh, async, which is what we'll be discussing uh, tomorrow or on Thursday, is already on there. So if you want to start looking at the material we will be learning, in lectures, there it's right here in Moodle already for you. So my point is, you don't have to wait for me to hit the lectures to start looking at this material, reading this material, watching videos that breaks it down just as well if uh, a, a, as I might break it down, so that you can at least start to understand the concepts. And then when I cover the concepts, you can either ask questions that didn't make sense from your readings of either the documentation or these other videos, or or the second iteration of the content might impress the ideas better into your mindsets uh, when I go to cover them. Uh, and, 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 and everything should be covered in here. So not just that, but React is already in there. You can already look at things related to the back end in terms of defi defining what it means to be REST or using alternate web clients, such as using curl or Postman to test your, uh, your REST API without having to have a front end to test it from, uh, your roadmap for uh, what it means to be a backend engineer and going from beginning knowledges all the way to advanced knowledges is defined in here. Uh, Node, and really all Node is, is a runtime environment of JavaScript that you can access from the operating system, from your terminal, where you're not required to have to go through the browser application, which means that we can start building scripts that just runs from the OS level. Uh, here, Express, that allows us to define our server. Again, I think I should have a video in there. Yep, I have a video that's a quick crash course on Express for Mongo, for user authentication using Passport. So pretty much everything you need to build a web application, I make sure you already have these resources available in Moodle so you don't have to scour the internet. So uh, I didn't, I, I, I'm not aware if I had mentioned that before. So I just want to highlight now that I'm giving you I'm articulating what the specifications are for the final project, that you also understand that in addition to all the content that I've been generating, which I put at the very end, actually, I, 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 provide, I provide all the things I've, I've made, the PowerPoints here, and our videos. In addition to this, you have plenty more content that you can be looking at to utilize. OK, so with that said, is there any questions about this? I want to take today's time. Because I know that everyone's kind of under the gun with midterms to talk more about what the end of the line for this class was going to be. And then we'll pick up with the kind of more routine, regular lectures uh, uh, 
on Thursday after the kind of midterm grades are, are due. So I, I'll leave the last two minutes of class open for questions. <laughs> I didn't anticipate actually talking that much uh, about just the project and these assets, but, uh, but it, it shows that this was worth dedicating a lecture to because it did cover, it did take a lot of class time to highlight all the different parts of the final and show you what is available to you and what the specifications are uh, so that everyone has seen it. Okay, so now I've, I, I've wasted another minute. So uh, you have a minute now to ask questions. I have one question. Uh, what's, what's the best way to really know if our proposal is within scope of like our skills? Would you just that's tell a, us? Or? So yeah, that that's I, I'm glad you asked, and that's exactly why I have the proposal due at April second, so that I can get feedback from you, and I can I can decide if your proposal is too small and whether it needs to have more features added to it, or if I think it's too big. And if it's too big, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to identify what would be the subset of features that you think would allow for you to create a deliverable. And so, uh, so, so yes, we're approaching this in what's called a very agile approach where I am a stakeholder and you are stakeholders. And by having all these documentations and audits, I'm interfacing with you so that you can responsively uh, uh, react to what I tell you and update your specifications and your expectations and your design with what uh, with the feedback I give you, so if you start by proposing something too large, I, I'll I'll get I I will convey that I have concerns that project might be too big, and that I'm not saying you can't do that, but to try to break that project down into smaller pieces to identify well you know maybe instead of an MMO that supports 12 different classes and has like 60 hours of gameplay what is the minimal version of something that looks like? Can you do something that has just one class that only has like three levels and that supports like almost uh, very little story content and start with, or almost no story content and just has like a, a level that you go through. And if you complete that, then maybe consider adding a second class to that uh, or add more than three levels, maybe add five levels. Does that kind of make sense? And that's the entire point of trying to identify what we're going to call an MVP, what your minimal viable product is that you can deliver and always striving to work on that first with an understanding that if you hit that, what are features that you can then bolt on or add on top of that? So when you produce these design documents, that's kind of, uh, and maybe I'll add that in the design document. One of the things I want you to do is kind of rate what are your important features or your user stories, and what are the ones that are supplemental? What are ones that would be nice to have if you can create a ranking, but you can cut out as not being critical to the overall app uh, application's uh, uh, deliverable? D does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, sounds good. Yeah. yeah, so, so, and, and even if you try to consider that, you might still make something too large. So, Based off of uh, my my experience of building web applications, I'll let you know what my concerns are and just. But really, I'll never tell you not to do something too big. I'll just have you create a roadmap that leads from something much narrower into something that would effectively be grown into what that final realization is, with the understanding that that final realization might not ever be achievable by even a singular person, like. Uh, with a big enough scope, you might need a team of individuals working uh, years even to build large scale applications, but it doesn't mean you can't plot out something like that. And so I'll, I'll let you, so really I'll help you map something that's achievable for small teams and doable in weeks and not years or months. Excellent, is there any other questions? Excellent. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, I hope everyone's excited about the final project. I'm super excited by the final project. Uh, the one last piece of recommendation that I might give uh, to those who are still here 
So I see that we have lost uh, about 12, which is fair because it's 318. As, as we move forward, another reason why I want you to start thinking about your proposal early on is that it's possible for you to uh, – it, it, it's possible that you can start using the homework assignments moving forward as proof of concepts for your larger scale application. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that. You might be inspired to do a, let's say, a browser application that makes uh, REST, IP, uh, REST calls to some API that allows you to create like a, uh, like a card game or that, I don't know, plots out like COVID data or something. Like maybe you want to learn how to use D3, you plot out a three-dimensional image of the globe, you pull from some remote database COVID data, and you do all sorts of like uh, graphical Ill, uh, visualizations of that data. That's perfectly fine. That might not be part of your, your app, but if you feel inspired to do that, uh, I, I like projects like that. But you can also use homeworks moving forward as means to test out things that you know you'll have to get done with your app. So it allows you to kind of stay on track. Uh, and I'm perfectly fine with that as well. Uh, just remember that any, any uh, application that you do design that's different than your full stack application is one additional application you could put it on your portfolio page. And I'm always about generating as much content that you can show off in your, uh, or showcase in your portfolio page as possible. But I just want to highlight the fact that I'm okay with you submitting applications that are proof of concepts. Now, with that said, a team can't submit the same application for a homework assignment. I do expect homework assignments to be individual based, whereas the final project is going to be team based. So it can only be a proof of concept if you have been assigned on the team to achieve some particular duty with inside your application. So does, does that part make sense? So I'm just opening that out as a opportunity for, for you to be able to say, oh, the homework's going to use this kind of technology and I have that kind of requirement that I'm working on. I can create a, a, a uh, test version of that, like a toy version that illustrates those purposes that I can then leverage into my code base. Now, I still prefer, I would prefer for all the homeworks to be autonomous from the full stack application, but I will make that option an option for those who uh, who 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 would like to do something like that. And we'll we'll see how that works. Again, this this entire thing is a uh, a trial a trial and uh, and uh, iterate approach that I'm taking. So maybe in the future I won't offer that opportunity if I find that there's too much overlap. Because I, I do think there is a value to be had by doing a similar thing in multiple ways. Uh, and I think that's the best way you'll learn it, not to do the same thing again and again and again. Okay. Well, with that said, I am done with my lecture today. I will let everybody back to uh, do their uh, midterms. I'm going to get back to doing audits and grading myself so that I can get everyone they're uh, great, although there should be no surprise to how your grades are because uh, I've been doing audits all the way through from the very beginning of the semester. So uh, there should not be any surprises there for anybody. Okay, so I will, uh, I will end this recording.